Hello, it's John Logan. I'm back to talk about another philosopher, and I am so excited for this one. I am going to be talking about one of my favorite saints, one of my favorite philosophers. Uh, I, I mentioned I made just made a video off of Edmund Husserl. I, I am very much uh, a big fan of the phenomenological thought. Um, and this person uh, was such a big influence in, my, in, in that, uh, in being influenced by phenomenology. Uh, so this person is Edith Stein. She's a saint, Saint Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, as she's known in her religious name. And she was just wonderful, uh, especially for the phenomenological thought. Uh, she would uh, critique a lot of people. Uh, if you read her writings, um, it's it's beautiful. There's just uh, there's just she stood for truth. She stood to. She didn't just take what people said at their word. Uh, she very much had to think through things. She was a realist. She was an analytic, uh, in that kind of sense. And she, yeah, it, it's just really beautiful sometimes when you just read and she's just critiquing people and makes some really valid critiques in a lot of it. Um, and she would even critique her her mentor, her uh, her boss, really, <laughs> uh, which is it was, she was very beautiful. And he would actually commend her and accept her critiques and her uh, corrections, which is a really cool thing. So a little bit of biography about Edith Stein's. Uh, she grew up in a, Jew a Jewish family, um, and it, it's actually funny. I, I've ran into many people, because she's a saint, um, many people kind of think she's probably lived this holy life all her life. N not so. She actually grew up agnostic. Uh, this is something she uh, was just convinced of. or It really probably wasn't even more so just a convincing, but more so just... That was just how her mind uh, concluded um, in this aspect, um, and God was not really an part of the equation for her as she was growing up. What was part of the equation for her was learning, and she was extremely brilliant, um, even since her youth. Always loved to study, always chose to study, always tried to learn more, and so this would be a big part of her life, is, is the life of studying, the life of gaining knowledge, and uh, actually, she is a very famous philosopher, but she's also, I think, um, underrated in her work in psychology and humanities, uh, and that was actually her deep love. That was actually what she was studying and uh, was very prominent in was psychology, um, and she, <laughs> in one of her works, uh, her philosophy of psychology, uh, again, there's this where she just critiques, uh, and it's beautiful. Uh, so she critiques a lot of her psychological uh, associates uh, Munstenberg would be someone she would critique uh, and there's a handful of others but uh, yeah so she was very uh, I think she's very underrated in that psychology field and a lot of neuroscience actually confirms and validates what she found in uh, her treatise uh, on sentient causality on the individual and the community uh, so just she's just was a brilliant mind and always had been um and so growing up when she came to that university age right being an agnostic uh loved learning then gets to the university age uh there were a couple things that kind of prompted her to go to the university um i would say there are kind of two factors you could say uh one of them was reading and she actually refers to this in in her works uh being influenced by reading uh the work i believe is an article in metaphysics by conrad martius uh, Edith Stein would have a profound respect for her, um, especially since actually in, in Germany around Edith Stein's time, it was actually relatively newer for women to be studying at the university. So seeing the work of Conrad Martius and reading how prolific she was and how brilliant was very much inspiring for Edith Stein. But really what, uh, what really was the biggest prompting for her was reading the logical investigations from Edmund Husserl. And if you don't know who Edmund Husserl is, um, He's the founder of Phenomenology. I have a video of him um, that I just made, so if you want to know a little bit more about the phenomenological thought and attitude, uh, be sure to check that video out. I do my best to give uh, a very basic introduction into that in Edmund Husserl. Um, but she read his logical investigations, and just was blown away, and basically just packed her bags, went to his university, and went to study under him, uh, which was pretty awesome. I can't say I wouldn't have done the same <laughs> um, if I understood logical investigations as well as she probably did. Um, 
Anyway, she uh, so she goes to study under Husserl and actually becomes his assistant in 1916 to, through 1918. Uh, being the assistant, uh, it, it's really funny. If you read Edith Stein, she is dense and very hard to understand. If you're not familiar with the phenomenological thought or attitude, it's very easy to get lost and kind of question where she's going. Uh, and so thinking she's hard to understand... Uh, it was said that Husserl was that much harder to understand, so she would be the one who would give, like, the, if it had a title in colleges, the introduction to phenomenology, and then once they would pass Edith Stein's um, class, they would go to Husserl himself. So she was uh, very prominent, Husserl was very fond of her, respected her work a lot, and I, I've mentioned that Edith Stein's not afraid to critique, she very much would critique a lot of people, um, which I think, it, it, critique, I think, is actually a gift that students can give to others, um, uh, and philosophers can give to each other, because it shows that their thoughts are actually uh, worthy of being critiqued, their thoughts are worthy of being uh, uh, corrected or um, studied. So uh, she very much was into critiquing. She'd even critique Husserl, and I think it's beautiful because Husserl would accept these critiques and corrections, um, and he would very much... Uh, translate it into his writings um, and change some things. Uh, so being his assistant, that's uh, that's how it was afterwards. She, uh, so she was his assistant, 1916 through 1918, and then uh, left him to try to teach on her own, but couldn't get anyone to endorse her, and wrote many dissertations trying to get into uh, teaching positions at universities, but uh, no one would really accept her. Um, and so uh, she went to tutoring. Um, she converted to Catholicism in 1922, I believe, um, and that was a very big change in her life. Um, then she started uh, seeking the Carmelite order, and she wasn't able to get there in, into the Carmelites at first, um, so she went on tutoring and uh, would teach to Dominicans, um, but then she was accepted. Uh, she died in 1942. Before she died, she was very much still a philosopher, um, and adopted the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, but it's, it's very interesting because Edith Stein wouldn't just say phenomenology out the door, Thomism, come here. Um, no, she w actually she approached Thomism through the phenomenological attitude, which I think was very beautiful because I think she uh, is a great example that, you know, you... you kind of like there's a gift in our rationality to, to think for ourselves and she very much did that she as Thomas Aquinas as prolific as he was she wasn't just going to read him and take him at face value she wanted to think through what he was saying so phenomenologically right in this idea of consciousness and experiencing right she would come to this conclusion um also phenomenology dealing with subjectivity not subjectivism subjectivity she would uh, approach it and she would really, through her experiencing, would be realize how this is objectively true, right? She would come to objectivity. Um, she had to ground a subjectivity in objectivity, and Thomas Aquinas was a great way for her to do that. But by approaching it phenomenologically, she would accept things, see how real it was, how tangible it is for the person, human person. But also she would critique it. She would also see that perhaps there are some things that are wrong, and she would certainly give critiques. She's very much into that critiquing. Um, but Thomas Aquinas did very much become an uh, influence in her. And then, uh, I think I already mentioned this, but she did, yeah, she passed away in Auschwitz in 1942. So that is a kind of, you could say short, probably was longer than I think it was, uh, analysis, or not analysis, sorry, a biography of Edith Stein. Um, now, while she was an assistant, this is kind of what I want to talk to on more her philosophy, while she was Edmund Husserl's assistant, uh, she wrote a dissertation, and it was on the problem of empathy. And so empathy is going to be the what I talk about that Edith Stein provided and contributed to philosophy. It was something, uh, for its time, so brilliant that actually Edmund Husserl himself would uh, comment on it and write uh, and adopt it into his own works and would publish it. Uh, her works through his journal investigations, or not investigations, sorry, his journal publications, um, and so it, it was highly praised by her mentor, uh, and so empathy, what is empathy, and I think, you know, there's common misconceptions of what empathy is, a lot of times I feel like we kind of think empathy is, uh, I'll put myself in the place of this person, 
and uh, try to feel what they're feeling. Uh, right? Like, uh, if something sad happened, um, I, I, I will uh, conceptually pretend like I'm in their shoes to see if I can feel what they're feeling. Right? I think that's a common view of what empathy is. Uh, and, and that and that's not what it is for Edith Stein at all. It's actually something much more beautiful. Um, and so what it is, in a basic definition, is a consciousness of another subjectivity. And um, that sounds perhaps simple, or um, if you're not familiar with these terms, subjectivity or consciousness of. Um, I would watch, I have made a video on Edmund Husserl. Um, on introduction to phenomenology, I talk about those kind of concepts. Um, so if you're not familiar, uh, you could check that out, and that might make this video a little more accessible. But Edith Stein, uh, co consciousness of and our subjectivity. This is going to be a very beautiful theme because if you think about it, we become consciousness of in the phenomenological attitude with many different objects, right? There's a correlation between these objects, right? The chair I'm having consciousness of, I am conscious of this computer, this screen that I'm making this video on, right? We are conscious of many objects. But Edith Stein, what she's going to remark, what we immediately become consciousness of is people. Why? Because when I am consciousness of an object, it's an object. But when I'm consciousness of a human person, I'm, it's not just an object, but I'm consciousness of someone, a subject, experiencing as well. This is what I mean by a consciousness of their subjectivity. Because they, I am consciousness of someone experiencing the world as I am experiencing the world, right? A rock doesn't do that. The chair that I am looking at is not experiencing the world, right? And so... This is the beauty that empathy is. It's a consciousness of. And so she would say it's immediate because we become immediately consciousness of someone else experiencing this world in their subjectivity, right? As a subject in a world of objects. Um, very similar theme in Kara Waitian, Love and Responsibility. Funny enough, uh, not related between uh, him and uh, Edith Stein because um, uh, Waitia uh, had was not familiar with Stein's works um, during that time, but it's very interesting. You, uh, you can really see that in this phenomenological attitude, uh, many, um, especially in this, these Catholic philosophers, come to these similar conclusions. But what's neat is actually Edith Stein was even Catholic at this point, um, very much agnostic. But back to this idea, right? It, so you become immediately uh, aware of someone else experiencing this world. And so this is a beautiful concept because it's this personalistic idea and she would very much have this influence from her mentors um and her associates as well one of them dietrich von hildebrand one of my favorite philosophers as well uh, i'll make a video on him later uh so yeah i have to dietrich von hildebrand's going to the side uh back to stein uh sorry <laughs> um yeah, so, so your consciousness of a subject experiencing the world, and that's very beautiful because it's this personalistic idea where there's a priority of the person. There's a uniqueness to the person, and there's a dignity to the person. Now, she's not going to be as explicit in saying dignity, but that's certainly what's being underlined here in this idea of empathy, right? That this person has a certain dignity in, in, their, in their experiencing of this world and their subjectivity. Um, and it's a very beautiful concept, um, but it's not just as simple as saying, well, I'm consciousness of uh, a person, you know, you know, who, yeah, I mean, they, they have their subjectivity, sounds great, but there, there is a deeper philosophy, right? It's not just that basic, um, because Edith Stein would say there's that feeling within, right? There's so, that's referring to the subjectivity, the feeling within, but she's also going to talk about uh, two different uh, contents, right? Because what she says in empathy, uh, it's not just the consciousness of their subjectivity, but you can actually share their experience. And what do I mean by that? Well, think about like this example of someone cutting their finger. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon because when someone cuts their finger, um, as it's being cut, right, and maybe you've had this experience if you're a parent and you see it with their child or, or if you have nephews or nieces, uh, as they cut their finger, Right before they 
uh, they cry out or um, express and saying ow or something like that, or you see the you even see blood, right? When you see this blade about to cut their finger or in the middle of cutting their finger, before the person whose finger is getting cut says ow or some uh, pain, uh, expression of pain, uh, and before you uh, reach to get a, a band aid or something to help them out or whatever, both shudder, both uh, startle, right? Yeah, you may perhaps you have had this experience, right? When someone does it, you you you're shocked, right? You have this experience of shuddering before this person even has the painful expression. They shudder as well, right? So there's this interesting thing where you're sharing an experience with them, and so this is what's that's going to be our example, right? You're sharing an experience in this empathy, your your consciousness of this subject experience in the world, but you're now you're sharing an experience. Uh, and there's a philosophical background that Edith Stein's going to give in her account on the problem of empathy. Her dissertation. I don't know if I mentioned this already, but it, it was written in the 1916 1917. Um, so, uh, while she was under Husserl. Um, but so we'll refer back to this example, right? Because she's going to refer to two things, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to deal with content, right? Because in, in this experience, right, there's content, right? We experience content. And um, there's going to be primordial content, and there's non-primordial content. This is all going to be under a primordial experiencing, right? Because both are experiencing this. But what she's going to say is the person who's being cut is having primordial content. The person who is sharing this experience, right, um, the one empathizing, is going to have non-primordial content. Now, what does this mean? Well, primordial content in a primordial experiencing is going to be, uh, it, it's it's the real experiencing, right? Say you're in this moment, um, or, or better yet, let, let's talk about memories. Um, that's very much a thing for Husserl um, in imagination. Um, so think of a memory. Uh, say perhaps you had a baseball game, uh, and you're playing baseball, or you're playing golf or something, or bicycling, um, and, and you're in that moment. You're So this is in the memory. This is when you actually did it. You're in that moment. That's a primordial experiencing with primordial content because that's that, that was what really happened you were in the present right you're in the present now if you recall the memory you are still having a primordial experiencing but it's with non-primordial content why because it's a memory it's not actually the, the, the this content is not before you corporately present right it's a in Husserl in language presentification or a representation right the memory and the the imagination that that gets that's a it's a whole conversation in its own right, but we won't go there. Uh, for now, right, this non-primordial content is something not present before me, right, but it's like it's like a memory. And so this is how she's going to distinguish it, right? The person, they're both having a primordial experiencing, but the person being cut is going to have primordial content, and the person empathizing is going to have the non-primordial content, right? But both are sharing in this experience, and I think this is the beauty of or uh, this is beautiful, found in Edith Stein's empathy, because what she's showing is very much the, the heart of personalism, um, and, and personalism is a beautiful movement in philosophy, a beautiful tradition, um, fairly new, um, certainly dangerous, because it, it has the danger of becoming uh, subjective, and or overly subjective, I should say, and focusing too much on the person in the sense of their feelings, um, and not being grounded in reality, but if if applied appropriately, um, I think especially it has to go hand in hand with Thomistic metaphysics and be grounded in reality. Uh, but if uh, applied appropriately, uh, personalism becomes this very beautiful thing, and I think she's identifying that in her subject, uh, being consciousness of in their subject, right? Because you're, you're really what you are. You're receiving their subjectivity in the sharing experience with them. Right, you're receiving their subjectivity, and that's a beautiful thing. Right, it shows how the inner dynamic of the human person, and how we relate to one another, this correlation that subjects have with one another. This is a beautiful topic. As I said, it's similar to Karawati, and it's really funny because they uh, he was not familiar with Edith Stein's works when he writes Love and Responsibility, but this is how he starts his book. Actually, it's it's pretty much like it, it it's it's uncanny how uh, similar it is to Edith Stein's on the problem of empathy. Um, and he would develop it and tap into the relationship between man and woman in, in the mystery of love. Um, and that's beautiful. Uh, maybe I'll make a video on that one as well. Um, 
but yeah, I think that's beautiful that Stein's identifying that, this correlation between subjects and how different that is. It certainly is different. Man is not merely an object, but also a subject in the world of objects, uh, grounded in objectivity. And then uh, just that a sharing experience, right? That, 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 that's what empathy is. It's that feeling within the sharing, the experience with someone, um, which I think goes deeper, right, than that simulation uh, uh, concept that I, I mentioned that perhaps is the misconception in today. Uh, I think it's deeper than that because you're not just placing yourself in another shoes, the simulation. You're actually feeling this with them. You're sharing this experience. Granted, yours is non-primordial content, but you're still sharing this. You're still having this primordial experiencing. Uh, and I think that is beautiful because, again, there's that correlation between the subjects and that's, I think, just a beautiful thing. And it, I think it lays the groundwork for Edith Stein. Uh, it contributed so much to the phenomenological attitude. And I think it, it actually contributes a lot in, in the theology of the body, um, especially the inner dynamic of, of, of how man and woman are capable of love, right? The, the capability of self-gift for one another um, it's between this correlation of subjects. Uh, I think that's a, a beautiful thing, uh, what John Paul II would call the spousal meaning or the nuptial meaning of the body. Uh, I think there's hints of that in this in this idea of empathy, and I think it's really brilliant. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's Edith Stein on the problem of empathy. So uh, I hope this was an informative video. If you liked it, please uh, like it and share it. Um, and if you want to learn more about phenomenology, I can make more videos on other phenomenologists. I'm hoping to do Dietrich von Hildebrand and Kara Wojtyla sometime soon. Um, but then also if you want, uh, if you think I'm focusing too much on phenomenology, uh, please tell me and, and I'll make more videos on uh, whatever uh, era you would like. Um, I'm hoping to do some medieval soon. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I hope this was helpful and I, uh, I highly encourage you, I'll end with this, I highly encourage you not to just take my word, uh, but in the heart and spirit of, of Edith Stein, uh, uh, t take up the reading, take up the reading of Edith Stein and uh, think about it for yourself and maybe you can critique her uh, as she did to others. Alrighty, thank you.